for our Lord Jesus Christ. Give the Lord all the praise. Give the Lord all the honor and all the glory. This is Lighthouse Radio to all our listeners on Cornerstone. May you be blessed. May the Lord's countenance shine upon you. And may you truly know that our God is faithful, our God is true, and our God is real. He will never leave us and He will never forsake us. My name is Prophet Rion. This is the course on the Holy Spirit called the Definitive Work on the Holy Spirit. And tonight I am presenting for you part two on this course, uh, part two of the journey through the tabernacle. The journey through the tabernacle, the last, uh, in the previous, um, well, at least in part one, when we looked at, you know, the journey through the, the spiritual journey through the tabernacle, we uh, started at, we started at what is the tabernacle, um, how we need to understand that the spiritual tabernacle of the Old Testament now lives in with our soul, within our spirit, soul and body, because of the blood of Jesus. And we have looked at how we can, you know, how before we can really experience God's presence, like a priest did in the Old Testament or in the Holy Place in the Holy of Holies. We have to go through a process of submission, of cleansing and sanctification. And we looked at, under the New Covenant, our walk is not physical, but it is spiritual. But the physical walk through the tabernacle as we find in the days of Moses and the days of Solomon and so on, it still holds great spiritual significance and great spiritual truths to our spiritual walk today as we grow closer to God and we seek the Lord. So, now in, in, in part two of this teaching, I want to look at the outer court or the courtyard. I want to look at the holy place and we'll see how we go from there. Like I said, this is quite an in-depth teaching. So, we need to understand that the journey through the tabernacle, of course, it starts, uh, you know, uh, when I'm, I'm not talking here about the physical tabernacle, it starts with the open door. You have to first go through the, through the, through the doorway to get into the courtyard. And we looked at how that doorway, um, it signifies on a spiritual level that Jesus Christ who is the door. He is the way and the truth and the life. So everything, of course, it begins with Jesus. It begins with our walk with Jesus. It begins with, uh, in a drawing closer to God, seeking God above all else. So, the journey through the tabernacle, it begins by the, the, the door, and then it proceeds to the bronze altar, which stands in the courtyard. So, and the bronze altar, it speaks of the need for ourselves to become living sacrifices unto God. Because remember, a altar speaks about a place of sacrifice. And that is according to Romans 12. The instruction for the altar in the Old Testament is, is given in uh, Exodus 27 verses 1 to 2 and there we read and you shall make the altar of Achaia wood five cubits long and five wide and the altar will be square and its height shall be for three cubits and you shall make its horns and its four, four corners its horns shall be one piece with it and you shall overlay it with bronze so Leviticus, Leviticus 1 uh, verses 1 to 4 in the Old Testament, of course, describes how sacrifice our sacrifices are to be presented at the tabernacle of Moses by the Israelites. Animals were to be without defect, and it says he shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So God instructed Moses in Exodus 40 verse 6 to place the altar of burnt offering in front of the way of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. 
Just so God is looking for a people who will worship Him in holiness and purity without defect. Therefore, a people who are willing to completely lay their old lives down to serve God. He is looking for a people who have gone through Jesus Christ who is the way to come and serve the Lord. He is still looking for a people who will meet with Him and He is still looking for a people who are hungry to come and to dwell in His holy presence. For this reason it says in Ephesians 5 and I'm reading for you the New King James Version from verse 25 it says, Husbands, Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might be sanctified and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she might be holy and without blemish. You see, Ephesians 5, therefore, refers back to the days of the Old Testament sacrifices, where the animal sacrifice was to be without blemish, without a spot or wrinkle. You see, if you brought a sacrifice before the altar that was blemished or that had a spot or a wrinkle, it was seen to be a, 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 a sacrifice of defect. And that, would, that sacrifice was not acceptable to God. It had to be an ex a sacrifice that was without blemish, without spot or wrinkle. Just so God is looking for a people who is willing to lay down their lives, who is willing to follow God at no cost, who is willing to work out their salvation with fear and trembling, so that they truly can move to a point where they are living sacrifices, worshipping God in spirit and truth, without spot, wrinkle or blemish. You see, we may never be as holy to the point of being without spot or wrinkle, yet God calls for a people who are holy as He is holy, according to 1 Peter 1 verse 16. Several offerings were made upon the altar of the tabernacle of Moses, and of course these offerings were burnt offerings of bulls and sheep, goats, doves or pigeons. Even great offerings were made consisting of cakes or wafers made of fine flour. Goats and lambs were used for peace offerings and sin offerings were made using bulls or lambs. A trespass offering was also made using a female from the flock, a lamb, a goat, a kid, a dove, a pigeon or grain. You see, the altar is also the representation of the cross. For Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice to set us free. The blood of Jesus had reconciled us to God the Father and our sins had been washed away. The tabernacle therefore remains a compelling symbol of God's forgiveness and grace. Through the sacrifice of sheep and goats done in the Old Testament, God sees the blood and passes over the sin of the people unto the coming of Christ, the ultimate sacrifice. So therefore now beyond the altar and old courtyard was another sacred object of the tabernacle of Moses, and this was the bronze laver, located between the tent of meeting and the bronze altar of sacrifice. And this rested just outside the tent, and served to cleanse the priest as they entered into the inner sanctuary from the Celtic outside as well as cleanse them ritually after performing the required sacrifices upon the altar. Exodus 30 verse 18 records the instructions God gave to Moses. It says, You shall also make a labor of bronze, with his base of bronze for washing, and you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. See, Aaron and his sons were to use the basin to wash themselves, their hands and feet, when they entered the tabernacle. Scripture warned that they should wash with water that they may not die. You see, God required purity, and in order for them to attain that purity, they had to be ritually clean. The labor outside the entrance of the tent of meeting served to meet this need. Every time the priest entered the tent, 
they were required to wash their hands and feet. It says in Exodus 38 verse 8, Moreover, he made the labor of a bronze, his base of bronze, from the mirrors of the serving woman who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So the labor was made not only of bronze, but also of mirrors. The exact function and nature of how these mirrors were used, or what they looked like, is also unknown. You see, the labor was used for purification of the priest working in the tabernacle of Moses. Now, the concept of the mirror reminds us of John James 1, which speaks about doers, not hearers only. And I want to read from verse 22, it says, but he, but be doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he, will, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Paul also refers to the mirror in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 12 where it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall just know just as I also am known. Therefore Paul alludes to the fact that there is indeed a journey of growth from glory to glory, so that we may not just understand and know dimly, but truly know the Lord. And we can only know the Lord more deeply and be doers of the word when we yield and submit to the Lord daily, therefore being a sacrifice and allowing his word and spirit to continuously cleanse us. And this can only be done when God abides in us and when we continually abide in the Lord. Indeed, water speaks of the representation of the word of God. For it says in Ephesians 5, 20, verse 26, it says, That he might sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of water by the word. This word implies both the written word and the spoken word. For the spoken truth, sorry. For Jesus is the word that became flesh. We have to therefore wash and cleanse our spirit, soul and body through submerging and submitting to the word of God. The word brings freedom and maturity. The water, of course, also speaks of our water baptism. The priests of old washed their hands and feet specifically because your feet and your hands regularly came into contact with the sinful world. So God is speaking here for a people who are set apart, a people consecrated. And this is how we must be under the new covenant. A people set apart, consecrated, who set themselves apart from the world, who will not be defiled by the world. Those who are pure and who are cleansed in the blood of the Lord and the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. You see, by washing the affected parts, you wash away the dust of sin. By cleansing yourselves in the Word and through baptism, we move from our old ways into our old new ways, sorry. So the first century Jew would have been readily familiar with the symbolism used. Many pool ex pools existed in Jerusalem for ritual cleansing, especially around the temple precincts. You see, the bronze laver was the holiest of all pools, resting just outside the tent of meeting where people, where God's presence dwelled. You see, it is important for us as believers to understand that much of what is discussed in the Old Testament is implemented into the New Testament. The symbolism used to describe Christ in many ways reflects God's construction of the tabernacle of Moses in the pages of Exodus and Leviticus. The tabernacle is a reflection of God's relationship with man. And in the New Testament, that relationship is embodied in Jesus Christ. Christ becomes the Christian's tabernacle, the very presence of God at the center of the individual's heart. Just so the washing waters of labor also find the Christian parallel in the act of baptism. John the Baptist baptized with cleansing waters in the early pages of the gospel. The water of baptism to the Christian functions in the same manner as the water of the labor to the Jewish priest during the days of the tabernacle of Moses.
It cleansed the individual of sin, allowing that individual to approach the presence of God. Just so we are reminded that we must daily emerge ourselves in the teachings and the guidance of the Word of God. By going through the process in the outer court, and I'm, I'm talking about the spiritual journey, we declare God is Lord in our lives. This is what the water baptism means. It means that we are setting ourselves apart, consecrating ourselves, committing ourselves unto God. And this is what the priest had to do in the Old Testament. Cleanse themselves. By denouncing the compromise and sin, we acknowledge that God is our King. And by taking the step of faith, we declare that we are sick and tired of problems and fear. That we want God's purpose and we want His strong guidance in our life. By crossing through to the holy place, we submit all to the Lord. As we heal to the Holy Spirit, we allow God to be the ruler over our soul, spirit, and body. And so when we reach this point of growth, we will begin to stand on God's word. For God is our refuge, our fortress of strength, and a shield of protection. And so therefore, let us remind ourselves, that it says in Psalm 23, who, as to Psalm 24, sorry, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has got clean hands and pure of heart. You see, God yearns for us to dwell with Him, John 15. But we need to go through this process of being daily sacrifices unto God, sacrificing all for His kingdom, allowing the Word and His Spirit to continuously cleanse us, renew our mind and our hearts, so that we can draw closer to God, so that we can become more like our Lord, so that we can dwell with Him, so that He can dwell with us. And this is why, you know, when it says that we must daily renew our minds, we, we must guard our hearts, because this is a daily process. Daily we are in this world, but we are not of this world. Daily we need to consecrate ourselves. Daily we need to deny ourselves. Daily we need to commit ourselves to God, so that we continue a spiritual journey to abide in God. So when you go out of the altar, out of court, Beyond the altar and the lay and, 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 and a bronze labor, you find you, the priest would enter the holy place, and the holy place you would find three sacred objects, each with a specific purpose and function. And these three pieces of sacred furniture was the table of showbread, the gold and lampstand, and the altar of incense. Again, I will repeat that: the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, or the menorah, and the altar of incense. And then I, I will explain to you how this has a spiritual significance for us today as believers under the new covenant. So God gives the, the, the Moses the instruction concerning the table of showbread in Exodus 25 verse 23. It says. And you shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long and one cubit wide, and one cubit high. You see, the table of showbread was assigned a place along the north wall of the table, the tent of meeting. Therefore, as one entered the only place from the courtyard, the veil would be seen in front, constructing the western wall of the holy place, separating the holy place from the most holy place. And on the right hand side, along the northern wall, outside the veil, rested the table of showbread. Now God gave specific instructions to Moses on how to utilize the table and what was to go on it. And these instructions were given in Leviticus 24, Verses 5 to 9, and I just want to read a small part. It says, Then you shall take a fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ether shall be in each cake. And you shall set them in two rows, six to a row, and the pure gold table before the Lord. Now these twelve loaves represented the twelve tribes of Israel. Bread was a common metaphor throughout the Old Testament as well in the New Testament. It represented life and God was the giver of life. In the Old Testament, or the New Testament, the, the, the disciples broke bread with Jesus during the Last Supper. The bread in that instance represented the life of Christ, the life giver to all mankind, Gentiles included. 
Therefore, the bread on the table of showbread represented God's provision for Israel, both through the manna in the wilderness and as God's Almighty, creator and giver of life. The tabernacle of Moses was a reflection of God's grace and love towards mankind in every way. Not only was the bread a symbol of God's provision, but it stood as a reminder of his covenant with Israel. In ancient times, covenants were sealed with a meal. In Exodus 24 verse 11 it says, The nobles of the sons of Israel affirmed their relationship with God by eating and drinking. Similarly, Abraham and Melchizedek, king of Salem, shared a meal in the valley of Sheba in Genesis 14 verse 18. So would God share this meal with his people in a temple or knuckle of Moses. And remember, I just or just you know, I, I just I just mentioned that how the bread is a reminder of God's covenant with Israel. Israel would be reminded that God is the one who gives life. God gave the manna. And just so under the new covenant, God broke bread. And he commanded us to keep this communion going, to break bread. Why? Because ultimately it is also for us the reminder of the covenant God has with us under the new covenant by the blood of the Lamb. For us, it is a reminder that He is also our life giver. He is also our provider. He is also for us the bread of life. Further description is given in, to the temple of showbread in Numbers 4 verse 7. It says, Over the table of bread of presence, they shall also spread a cloth of blue and put on it the dishes and the pans and the sacrificial bowls and jars for the liberation, for the libation, and the continual bread shall be on it. You see, the presence was of God as God himself. His presence dwelled and empowered the tabernacle of Moses. And every Sabbath day the bread was replaced by new loaves. Aaron and his sons would then eat the old loaves, and the bread was reserved for them only. In eating of the bread of the presence, Aaron and his sons were renewing their covenant with God through the covenant meal. It served them as well as all of Israel as a reminder of the covenant God entered into with them at Mount Sinai. And centuries later, Jesus would eat with his disciples, telling them the bread would slain to serve as a reminder for his body and sacrifice for us all. And we must be reminded when it comes to the table, there must be a continual bread on it, reminding us that we must continually be in the presence of and in fellowship with God. We must continually partake of God, fellowship with God. We must continuously be in His presence because that is where we will continuously receive our life. Of the first disciples, we read the following in Acts 2 verse 46, it says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to brows, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Truly these disciples were moving from glory to glory for they were willing to sacrifice themselves and they, were, and they stayed in fellowship with God by constantly honoring the Lord through communion. They constantly honored and paid tribute to the sacrifice of God. They con continuously honor God as the life giver and the covenant they have with God. And so by breaking God, they constantly paid honor to God as the provider, just as he provided the daily manner in the wilderness. What we find with the table of showbread, also called the table of presence, concerning that there must be continual, continual bread, links up with Leviticus 6 verse 13, which speaks about the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. Again, this speaks in your New Testament context of how we must be continually be willing as to be a sacrifice unto God, seeking Him and being in fellowship with Him.
After all, Jesus said, if we wish to follow him, we must deny ourselves and carry the cross. And as we do so, then John, first, John 15 verse 1 becomes a reality, where we abide in the Lord and he abides in us. Indeed, with the table, we submit our will to God. Bread is food which indicates that we must allow our spirit, soul and body to be continuously fed by God. We must sacrifice our will and trust in God to provide for us. At the table of incense, we allow God to take control of our emotions through praise and worship. So we must open our hearts and emotions so that God will receive our love. And this table we must also be reminded that we must not just allow God to feed us but we must also feed others with the word of God therefore making disciples according to Matthew 28 the great commission in John 21 Jesus after his resurrection tells Peter three times to feed his sheep if he loved the Lord so as the Lord feeds us with his manner, his presence, as he fellowships and abides in tabernacles with us, we must feed others not just spiritually but also physically. Again, Hebrew living in Jerusalem would have noticed the symbolism when Jesus spoke of the words of John 6 verse 35 when he says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. 1st century AD, Israelites would have likely associated the bread of life with the bread on the table of showbread in the temple. Now Exodus 25, verses 31 to 40, describes the golden lampstand which provided light for the priest as they worked in the holy place. As the table of showbread was located along the northern wall of the tabernacle of Moses, the golden lampstand stood on the southern wall on the left hand side as one entered the tent. The lamp was to stay lit continuously as it was one of the duties assigned to Aaron and his sons. Leviticus 24 verses 2 to 4 says, Command the sons of Israel that they may bring to you clear oil from beaten olives for the light, to make a lamp burn continuously Outside the veil of testimony and the tent of meeting, Aaron shall keep it in order from evening to morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall keep the lamps in order on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continuously. So when speaking of the lampstand, we visit, of course, Zechariah 4. And this is the vision he had of the lampstand and all the trees. And we read from this four, it says, Now the angel who talked with me came and wakened me as a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And so I said, I am looking and there is a lampstand of solemn gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. And two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other on its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And, is? and I said, No, my Lord. Verse 6, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So the lampstand speaks of the work of the Holy Spirit. It speaks about the anointing, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It speaks about the the, the, the light of the Holy Spirit that it will that will illuminate and make clear our path. John 16, of course, from verse 5 it says, But now I am going away to him who sent me, and none and none of you ask me where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow is full to heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the help will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin. Because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. You see, this is the work of the Spirit casting light and conviction on the manner of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. The Spirit has also come to lead and to guide us in all truth. 
He has come to illuminate our path, to make open, to make clear the path so we can become more like our Lord, leading the path to our Lord, for He is the way and the truth and the life. Indeed, the Spirit of the Lord leads us in the truth and the path of the Lord, who is the light of the world, according to John 8, verse 12. And we also read in 1 John 1, verse 5, where it says, This is the message which we have heard from Him and declared to you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we do say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the, the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, such is the manner and the work of the Spirit to continuously lead us in the ways and the path of the Lord, to convict, to guide, and to make sure we keep the ways of the kingdom. Take note that the lamp stand had to be continually lit, just as there needs to be continually bread on the table. Therefore, we are reminded that we must continually seek the Lord, be in His presence, and walk by the Spirit all the time. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19 says, speaks about not quenching the fire of the Holy Spirit, meaning we must continually submit, yield, and follow the Spirit in all that we do. Such a relationship of yielding and submitting, one can say, was shown in a vision to Ezekiel in the first chapter. Revelations 1 verse 12 says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. Revelation 1.20 therefore reveals the mystery of the seven gold lampstands being the seven churches. The seven churches in the book of Revelation speaks of the entire condition of the bride. Yet God wants a bride that is continually alight with the Spirit, therefore walking in the glory of God, therefore being worshippers in spirit and in truth. Revelation 2, we read of the loveless church, the following in verse 5. Remember therefore for where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. To remove the lampstand is really about being removed from the presence of God, who is the light of the world. After all, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. This is how serious it is if we continue to seek our own ways and do not yield and submit to the ways of the Lord. We are called to repent and to turn away so that the devil cannot lead us into darkness, so that the Lord above all can lead us in the light, so the Holy Spirit can lead us in the ways of God. So when we consider the lampstand and we and, and, and we, we when you consider that the lamps were lit, that it produced a bright light, when we renew our mind in the Holy Spirit we experience the same effect. Wisdom and insight from the Holy Spirit illuminates our thoughts. Remember Isaiah 11, verse 1, you read about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of wisdom and of counsel, the Spirit of knowledge. That is what happens, that's what the Spirit does. He leads us, He helps to renew our minds. He helps us to, to follow the truth, to, to, to be led in the truth, not to be deceived, not to be led astray. The lampstand is the representation of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God has been with us since before time, Genesis 1. Before there was anything, the Spirit of the God moved out of the darkness. It was not out of the darkness that light and creation burst forth. Sorry, it was out of that darkness that light and creation came. It also says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So again we return to Isaiah 11, which speaks of the Holy Spirit of counsel, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Indeed, by the wisdom and the knowledge of the Lord, we are led in all the truth. In the beginning of the creation of the world, we find from out of nothing came forth life, and then came creation as we know it. So therefore, within that presence lays the awesome power of God, and that awesome power is not just around us, but it is in us. By yielding and submitting, we open the door for God's power to flow within us. And what is that power? That power that came from on high. Acts 1 verse 7, the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit. John 7 verse, verse 38 says, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. 
Also take note that the trimming of the lamp is done in the conjunction with burning incense on the altar of incense. Exodus 30 verse 7-8 depicts Aaron and the priest burning incense every morning when he trims the lamps and then again when Aaron trims the lamps at twilight. Therefore there was perpetual incense, perpetual light and bread before God in the tabernacle of Moses. Indeed, as we grow spiritually and to consciously sense God's presence to be to, to surrender to God the Father and the Son, who has cleansed us by the blood and the Holy Spirit and the written word of God, every day we must be cleansed, we must we must commit ourselves to God. Every day we must allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. We must therefore be sacrifices daily to God and our old life must be placed on the altar daily. This is the process of crossing the spiritual bridge of Jesus Christ. Like I said, the last object in the holy place of the tabernacle was the altar of incense. Exodus 30 verse 6 describes within the table of Moses what this object what was the purpose? It says, And you shall put this altar in front of the veil that is near the ark of the testament, in front of the mercy seat that is over the ark of the testament, and there I will meet with you. So the altar of incense was placed in the middle of the western wall of the holy place of the tabernacle of Moses. The western wall of the holy place was created by the veil that hung and separated the holy place from the most holy place, where the mercy seat that is over the ark of the testament was. So as one entered the tabernacle of Moses, the altar of incense would have been directly in front, resting against the veil. Remember the tabernacle of Moses was set up as a system allowing God to dwell amongst his people. Animal sacrifices were required on a daily basis for a number of different reasons. On the day of atonement, sacrifices lasted continually throughout the entire day. The smell associated with the blood and the carcasses of all these animals would have been very strong. So the incense served to alleviate the smell. It also symbolically represented the prayers of God's people. The incense from the golden altar of incense produced an aroma pleasing to the Lord. King David wrote of his prayers of incense in Psalm 141 verse, verse 2 it says, May my prayer be counted as incense before thee, the lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. Now it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, For we are the sweet fragrance of Christ, which exhales unto God, discernible alike among those who are being saved and amongst those who are perishing. To the latter is aroma wafted from death to death, a fatal order, the smell of doom. To the former it is aroma from life to life, a vital fragrance, living and fresh. So where does the sweet aroma come from? It comes from the anointing of God. The anointing comes by a life in the Spirit. And once we walk as believers separated from the world and separate from religion and man-made traditions, we walk in the aroma of the Lord. As we lead a life, therefore, by the Spirit, then we shall walk in the sweet aroma of the anointing that empowers and enables us to be witness unto the Lord in this world. Someone who walks in anointing and who lives by such anointing should live so in God's glory that his entire life must testify to the Lord's truth and holiness. You see, we must be completely submitted unto the Lord, following His ways, and walking in the Spirit to be completely and utterly moving in the anointing. We can never but never become fragranced and walk in His righteousness and wisdom and truth if we do not walk in His presence. If we are not soaked in the anointing and changed by it, then many aspects of our lives will not reflect such anointing. And by such a, a reflection, one portrays God's holiness and glory. This is therefore the life in the Spirit, the life of being separated to serve the Lord. It is a life of prayer, of fellowship, and seeking the Lord. And the New Testament prayers were also represented as incense. Revelation 5 verse 8 says, And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. 
This incense therefore served as an extremely important function. Its smoke stood for the prayers of God's people which ascended to his throne. Therefore Aaron and his sons were to burn incense throughout the day, as portrayed in Exodus 30 verse 7 to 8 it says, And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it, he shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamp, and when Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So burning the incense was the special honor and the privilege given to Aaron and his descendants. And such they were to keep the incense burning by doing so at least twice daily, as scriptures betrays. However, there was to be a specific incense that was to be burnt only, and any other incense fell out under a dire warning given in verse 9 in Exodus 30 it says you shall not offer any strange incense on this altar or burnt offering or meal offering and you shall not pour out a libation on it see God is holy therefore his house was to be holy as well God instructs Moses to beat the substance into a very fine product to be used as incense before the Lord God is specific. The incense is to be used in the tabernacle of Moses only. Scripture warns that any of the people that attempt to make the mixture for their personal use will be cut off from his people. Therefore we are reminded that we are called to be a living sacrifice unto the Lord, healed and submitted, so that we may exude a beautiful fragrance, so that we may truly offer up worthy praises to our God, so that our prayers may not be self-centered, but may be truly be Christ-centered, Christ-focused, glorifying, exalting God. We are called to be holy and pure before the Lord, not allowing the yeast of this world or any other form of yeast to affect us. We are called to be worshippers in spirit and in truth. And so we are reminded of Psalm 24, as I mentioned, who can ascend the hill of the Lord, or may he stand in his holy presence, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. This is what it truly means to God that we must serve Him and worship Him. We must come to Him as a continual sacrifice, continuously committing ourselves, continuously in, in, in fellowship, never quenching the fire of the Holy Spirit, never stepping out of God's presence, never turning from the light to the left, but always abiding in God's holy presence. This is what it means to truly dwell and to walk the spiritual journey, to commit yourself to fellowship, to always serve God and not to not to walk in the darkness but always to seek the light, to walk in the wisdom and the counsel of the Holy Spirit, to walk in God's presence to His glory forevermore. I will conclude this teaching on a spiritual tabernacle and of course um, next time in part 3 when we will look at the Holy of Holies may you be blessed may the countenance shine upon you may you know that the Lord loves you may you, may you seek Him may you be, you be seek the Holy Spirit to lead you in all that you do may the Holy Spirit lead you in that wisdom and that counsel that knowledge and the power and the fear of the Lord to the Lord's glory forevermore this has been Lighthouse Radio to all the Cornerstone listeners as well May the Lord keep you and bless you. My name is Prophet Rayon. Until next time, God bless.